Welcome everybody. I hope you're having engaging time at the summit. Um, I think uh, we did a keynote earlier today and I think this will be much more detailed and at the end we'll probably have time for a few questions. Uh, here with me uh, are uh, some folks and one guy doesn't have his name there but so I'll say his name before everybody else. He's Jeff Gibbons. Uh, he's the Director of Engineering responsible for running and building the cloud. Uh, this is Kalyan. Uh, he's uh, responsible for the engineering effort and you know contributing and whatnot. Uh, this is James Down. Uh, he's the principal architect. He's the one who built the cloud for Walmart. So he was the champion in Walmart to get OpenStack into Walmart, so which is a big challenge. Um, uh, so he got it in, and you know he's the one who can tell you about his horror stories from Folsom to Grizzly to not so painful Havana to even less painful Juno, and uh, hopefully in the next uh, Kilo release, there'll be no pain. Uh, but then where's the fun and no pain, right? So, um, so I'm going to start with a brief history about Walmart, and we've already talked uh, you know, before uh, in the keynote. We are a retailer, large retailer, uh, and also a large technology user. Um, so we are... A, um, as I said, we have the largest, we built the largest private satellite network when inter internet wasn't there. So we always look for solving our big problems, looking for uh, you know, creative solutions and technologies, and if we find one, we go all out. We don't you know, short change in something. You know, any technology, when we adapt, we become huge and big in it. Uh, our story is, again, very simple. You know, we'll talk about our challenge, and then you know, what uh, we will talk about what was the vision and strategy in getting you know, uh, you know, every, everybody aligned to uh, solving the problem in a technical technology way? Uh, then we'll talk about the execution, which again, a lot of times we forget about. It's, it's, it's also all these strategies, most good strategies fail with bad execution, so execution is a critical component. And obviously, what, was, what is the promise of OpenStack? and how good it is, and which all of you, you since the fact you guys are here in Vancouver, which um, I don't think we'll have to spend too much time in the, you know, the, the ability of OpenStack. Our challenge, I think, um, you know, physical scale, a large retailer, a lot of shelf space, a lot of you know, billions of items on hundreds of millions of square kilometer of uh, shelf space, uh, so huge scale, 250 million, Customers step into our stores, our digital um, properties, um, so it's huge. Uh, you know, digital scale, uh, 10, I think now it's about 11, so we keep adding more properties. Um, we have about 1.5 billion page views, 21% growth. And more than that, I think this is, this is the frontier where you know, we, we are growing faster than anybody else. We are bringing in new products. We, we, you know, there's exponential growth, but we're bringing new products. We brought a savings catcher, which I talked earlier today. It's, it's, these are the kind of new benefits which we want to give our customers who already come to Walmart for the everyday low prices. They'll get some more. E-commerce 3.0, you know, this is where digital and physical is same. There is no concept of fulfillment center. Every shelf is a fulfillment. Uh, opportunity. I mean, every store from a neighborhood store to a super center to Sam's Club to whatever properties, physical properties we have, combined with the digital fulfillment centers across the globe, that's the promise of e commerce 3.0. It's any, 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 any product, anywhere, anytime, you know, you know d d deliver to your home, deliver to your office, picked up from uh, <clears throat> the store, pick up from, picked up from kiosk, picked up from uh, lockers, so any product, anywhere. Uh, in terms of what we needed to solve this problem, I mean, we, we wanted to have, uh, you know, obviously we didn't want to spend too much money, you know, don't, didn't want to pay arm and, arm and leg. Uh, uh, obviously we wanted it to be secure, we wanted it to be scalable, uh, we wanted it to be highly available, we wanted it to be distributed. And also, uh, you know, our, our developers and engineers wanted agility and the on-demand nature of infrastructure. They, they, most of the times when the new applications are delivered, uh, built or delivered, uh, 
you don't know how successful that's going to be. And we wanted to be able to iterate over whatever we produced. And that's where our vision and strategy, our tech, uh, being, being a technology arm of Walmart, that's where our team got together heads down, led by um, James Downs, to build the vision and strategy for the cloud. So the vision and strategy really was that we were in the middle of rebuilding the e-commerce platform that we were doing. So we needed uh, something to accelerate the company uh, in ways that Walmart had never used before. So Walmart's a big company. We've used traditional IT services the whole time. Cloud brought something else to the picture, potentially. And we really needed two things. We needed a more agile way to deploy things. We needed to be self-service, and we needed automation. And all of those things come together. Uh, when I first came to Walmart, uh, deploying a VM was a series of tickets, a series of people okaying even having a VM, and sometimes it took as much as a week to get a VM. So in order to make any of the cloud, well, well that is cloud, right, fast is cloud, to get any of the newer things that we wanted to deploy even working, cloud was sort of a first thing that we really needed. And two things go with that as well. So you have to have your developers doing self-service things, uh, and you have to use automation so that the self-service and the cloud infrastructure can do what it needs to do. Um, and so we talk about a bit about elasticity. And that's the need of the Elastic Cloud. Amdeep mentioned it earlier. Holiday is 10x more traffic than the rest of the time. Uh, so we have really elastic workloads. Um, and one of the things that we want to be able to do is offer uh, you know, PQA environments, dev environments, staging environments, give places for developers to run their code. Also in production, if you do it all in a cloud, you can take some of that capacity and turn off the staging environments or turn off the performance environments. Uh, and use instead that capacity for something like Holiday. And these are some of the things that we're still working on because we need to answer some of the security and separation problems. Is, for example, you know, how do you keep your QA databases from, or QA applications from talking to your production databases? And if you don't do separation and security pieces properly, you have things that happen like QA talking to production databases. Um, which becomes a big cleanup problem. Uh, one of the other problems that we have right now is that, and I think our guy who does capacity is somewhere in here, uh, we don't have a good chargeback or showback model right now. Uh, we're not really set up for it uh, within the company. And so pretty much our developers use more and more capacity without any sort of downward pressure on the usage that they have. And we're working on some good chargeback showback models to allow you to say to a VP or to an application group, hey, your application is costing us X number of, I'll just say millions of dollars, it's probably not that much, right? Uh, X number amount to run your application. And I think that that's what really makes some of the cloud models work is that, yes, it's elastic, yes, you can use what you need, but if there's no downward pressure on your usage, the cloud models don't really work. It's just VM sprawl like we've dealt with forever, right? Um, the other thing that we really needed to address was Walmart scale, and we're moving all of our applications from existing platforms onto cloud platforms, and this meant that we were going to have the kind of exponential growth that we saw in the slides that um, actually I think we reuse. I think we reuse that slide. Um, but we needed to, to know that we could scale beyond a rack of gear, two racks of gear some dev environments, uh, we had to go into much, much larger environments, right? We needed to hit production scale. And we dealt with uh, the questions of, okay, well, this is an open source project, and we're bringing a large open source project into a big enterprise. And there's some scary things about adopting open source, right? Um, bringing bigger open source projects to Walmart is something that we've begun to be able to do, and OpenStack proving itself at holiday scale this past year means that there's a solid base for Walmart to deploy cloud on, and that's OpenStack. So thank you guys. 
that bet from the beginning that OpenStack was going to make it paid out, and we took holiday traffic last year. And thank to, thanks to all the other Walmart guys here who helped make that happen as well. Another reason that OpenStack is important to us, no matter what flavor of it we sort of release or use, giving back is a Walmart value. So there's a couple of items here of ways that Walmart has given back to the community. And we're not contributing a lot of code right now yet, but that is one of our goals. And we have given back or con contributed and open sourced a lot of code, mostly in our mobile area. Um, some of our platform teams have some things that they'll announce a quarter or two later. Um, but OpenStack gives us a way and it gives operations people a way to contribute back to the community. So that's one of the reasons that we chose OpenStack, is that it was something that we could do um, that's not readily available with very many other cloud operation systems. That brings us a little bit about how we did this. Um, you can draw a gigantic Visio diagram and plunk all of the, by the way, I stole this slide. It's been making its round somewhere. So if anybody knows who made this, Nobody seems to know who the slide is from. I'd love to give attribution to it. Um, anyway, so all the cloud technologies, you can plump, plunk onto a big Visio diagram, right? You can't deploy that Visio diagram from day one, right? You can't, all the pieces aren't there. We don't even know what we're going to do with some of the pieces. So the idea here is that we deployed as little as possible that was gonna make our customers happy. And for us, that meant starting with a compute cloud. Uh, the other thing that we found uh, along the way is you start talking to developers, or you talk to our developers anyway, and you ask, what do you want? What will you use in a cloud? What services do you want? And we started talking to them uh, and hearing, well, it would be great if we had volume services, because then we could make a volume, configure it the way we wanted to, clone it, and attach it to all of our VMs. If you look back a couple of slides, you see that automation is something that we have to get them using or we can't really deploy cloud applications. So we started with a cloud deployment that didn't have any storage. So I'm going to have to go ahead and, and disagree with the SolidFire uh, keynote earlier. We have a successful cloud that has no storage services in it right now. Uh, and, and the reason simply is we wanted to keep people from cheating on automation. So the next big, one of the next big projects we are doing is storage and solving some of those issues. The other big issues that we have here, and this is for Simon, is that capacity planning is, is tricky. So we had so much pent up demand that we would bring on new regions of capacity and they would fill up almost faster than we could onboard people into Keystone. Um, and that goes back to the problem of, well, well how, do you, how do you plan capacity? How do you um, manage what people are using? And what we're seeing is that you know, quotas are only part of the picture, right? Um, in trying to provide capacity to people, giving them exactly the quota that they need today and following a sort of resources model or or a model that you would use for physical hardware doesn't work in the same way. That quote is used up like that, right? And then they want more. So you're always adding more capacity. That's awesome if you're a public provider because you charge you know, X number of cents per minute for everything that all of your users are using. In a private cloud in an enterprise, that's horrible because now you just used up all your capacity for the whole year, your budget's gone, and what are you gonna do for the next quarter, right? Um, and we're still developing some of those models. The chargeback showback model, I think, is very important. You need to be able to give people some way to have a downward pressure uh, on what they've got and what they're using and to show a value for what they've got. But additionally, um, I, you know, dealing with quotas and dealing with back to the elasticity, you have to have enough extra capacity that people have the feel of elasticity. Even if you don't have unlimited hardware, and you don't, right? Even the public cloud providers don't have unlimited uh, capacity. What you have is the feeling for capacity. And we're still working out those models uh, in a world where everyone uses as much of everything as they can possibly get. And I like this slide because 
It's the opposite of the slide that Amandeep had uh, earlier. Amandeep was talking about taking the math mess that we had of all the different applications running in all of our data centers, uh, and to a large degree, we didn't know the interaction of the different pieces in the, the old platform. In the new platform, we do know what the pieces are. It's all service-oriented. Uh, it's all clean deployments. But what we're looking at in this slide here is the idea that we've had to train our developers and our operations people and everybody used to running the traditional existing platform to say, look, you don't know where that VM is. And you kind of don't want to know where it is. And you don't know what piece of hardware it's on. And you kind of don't want to know what piece of hardware it's on. Oh, and by the way, when that hypervisor fails, it's up to you to make sure that your application keeps running. So in, in many ways, the traditional, IP, I, uh, traditional IT world of physical hardware and even of VMware, where you are doing specific placements, turns into, well, you got to let go of some pieces. And that's one of the hardest things that I think, uh, especially for operations people, right? Operations people are kind of control freaks, right? I'm, I'm one of them. And you have to, to a certain degree, say, I can be OK with not knowing exactly everything at every moment. So the first thing that people say is, well, we need a CMDB, right? So we need a record of where all the VMs are. And my challenge to the, to the operation team has always been, you don't need to know where everything is an hour ago. You need to know where something is right now when you're trying to track down a problem. And that's where the APIs come in, is you don't need a database that tells you where every VM is right now. You need a, VM or a, a API that you can call that tells you where that VM that's misbehaving is. So, you know, in a, in a pet's world, you kill it off. Sorry. Wow. I, it's a good thing I don't own any pets, right? Uh, it, <laughs> we don't like some of those pets very much, right? So in a, in a cattle world, you know, you just replace it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kellyanne. Hey. So uh, I know Amandeep talked about uh, pain um, and when we move from one version of OpenStack to another version of OpenStack. And uh, I'm sure all of you have heard a lot of scale and scale. In my uh, short journey into Walmart, my six months into Walmart, I mean, scale is what amazed me and actually took me back. And i uh, very fortunate that all of our execution team uh, was able to attend the OpenStack Summit, and they're sitting here with us in Vancouver. So uh, it's been a great experience. So pain from upgrades and uh, scale, it's more pain. <laughs> so this is where all of our execution thing has come. Um, so I know we're doing, um, I mean, OpenStack is going through a six months uh, release cycle, and we're a bit behind. Uh, we currently have our production in Juno. But um, for us, it is very, very important to lock down on calendar dates. Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday are super critical. Those dates, we cannot fail. I mean. We have to plan releases and schedules accordingly so that we don't disrupt that cycle. So regardless of the community and the contribution, and so engineering and execution has a very, very unique challenge in that sense. Um, all, um, all of our infrastructure initiatives are agile methodologies, and we follow uh, two-week uh, sprint cycles. And uh, we really have like three pillars within the whole execution and the OpenStack engineering team. So there's the OpenStack engineering team, there's a cloud build team, and the cloud operations team. These three pillars are primarily responsible for delivering on time um, and the newer versions of OpenStack clouds before it hits into the platform or into the application teams and before they get it into their hands. Um, all the tools that have been, um, have been written around internally are uh, primarily in Java, and our long-term strategy and plan is to move them and eventually port them, at least some of them, into Python for now. Uh, we do have, um, I think there was a mention of about 40% enterprise applications still on being on .NET and everything else. So on the storefront um, and the e-commerce, it's a bit different in the Walmart world. Uh, we do have a lot of .NET presence as well in the tools. So. For our uh, private cloud data centers, uh, several data centers, um, I'm not uh, allowed to give specific numbers, uh, but two of them are primarily largely onto OpenStack, entirely onto OpenStack. And uh, these are now almost at the verge of getting everything upgraded onto Juno. 
uh, last uh, uh, holiday, 2014 holiday, was completely run on Havana. And uh, we're there. Uh, and uh, our engagement is with several partners, right all the way from hardware to the uh, tool side of things. Um, one of our vendors that is, that is supplying the generic hardware, actually they do a, a factory rollout of Express. We do burn and tests extensively, and it's a uh, roll-in process into these data centers where we get uh, all the racks assembled on site, delivered, and two, we, uh, last holiday we deployed 2,500 nodes with um, half a dozen of an organization or a dozen folks in the organization. So that's a tremendous feat that we in com completely leveraged our partners for. The newer servers that we've got are 50% cheaper than what we've traditionally been investing. So ever since we embarked into the OpenStack and generic hardware, we have 50%. And these servers are two times more powerful. And we've decreased our managed node cost, our total operating expense by total number of servers by around 300%. Right now, and the intent is to keep getting the next generation of servers from our vendors on generic hardware. Um, on the uh, image front, we are uh, currently using Ubuntu images for our hypervisor and controllers. Uh, our guest images that the application teams use are uh, primarily CentOS and uh, Red Hat. Um, the flavor sizes has been a uh, contentious issue and uh, I think several applications require different sizes of the VMs. So we offer small to what we call 3XL. Uh, so this is essentially your compute and your memory footprint that each application requests based on their capacity and um, how they put through those requests. So all these VMs are of different sizes. Um, and this it comes in through our one ops, which is our uh, pass layer. Um, so it used to be. 90-day turnaround in average time. And we have now taken that down to 90 machines per minute is what we can provision and what we can provide. So that's a um, fantastic turnaround that the application teams are already seeing, and they're benefiting largely from this stuff. Right, so this is uh, literally farm to table, if need be. And we, we try to keep that, and we do a little bit of an extra capacity during the holiday. So there's a lot of capacity planning that goes on to make sure that we don't uh, break anything during our holiday and our critical dates and time zones. Um, so we can grow application workload on demand. We can patch the nodes for security. We can bring down if we suspect any of the VMs have become vulnerable and they have been breached. So we can move across data centers. We can fail nodes. We can take off the workloads. We keep our uh, applications balanced between data centers and for fault tolerance. So in our uh, history, I think we've come across a long way. Uh, as James probably mentioned, Folsom, or was it Grizzly? We started with Folsom. And I'm sorry. We, still we, have still have we actually have three nodes still running ASICs, but there's no workload on them, and we just have to get our capacity manager to turn them off. <laughs> He's in the audience. That's why yeah. So older builds, maybe uh, in a legacy hardware, what we call legacy hardware is, again, re uh, still fairly relatively new. But um, the execution and the engineering team, the operations team, is very, very quick about um, seven-day break fixes. So they get uh, things up and running fairly quickly. Um, I'm happy to know that these are still running. And our production subscription is a little over two is to one ratio. So we do over-provision um, most of the uh, workloads in our two entire OpenStack data centers are running production workloads. There may be a little uh, footprint of dev and uh, QA VMs in there. Uh, so for 2014, we had one tenant in, a, in, in the entire Elastic Cloud. And we want to move other tenants. You keep hearing about other markets that Walmart has already acquired uh, across continents and, and several other countries. But uh, the plan of record for 2015 is to bring several other markets also into the OpenStack clouds and move them into our uh, thing. So the eventual goal in the near future, uh, how far out is that near future, uh, is something we'll probably get back and you'll hear more from us. Um, 
to be able to give data center as a service, so DC as a service, and that's what we would like to eventually be able to offer to our markets. Uh, so this slide is essentially the IS and the PaaS and the SaaS layers. The uh, IS team is the one that is essentially the three pillars that I talked earlier about that is offering all these workloads. But um, all the RESTful APIs were originally written in Ruby, and uh, right now we're just standardizing our infrastructure components to our DNSAS, LBAS, STAS, etc. And OneOps was acquired in 2013 on the PaaS layer. So they are responsible for the provisioning of the VMs into the application teams and uh, offering um, all of the capacity. Um, so going forward, I think in-place upgrades is what we are mostly focusing on. Um, we did not do an in-place upgrade from Havana to uh, Juno. Uh, and, and we skipped High's house, but the plan of record is to uh, hopefully have a seamless in-place upgrade going from Juno into Kilo in our production data centers. Um, Havana, again, ran our Black Friday and Cyber Monday, uh, 1.5 billion pages uh, in our page views. So this is fantastic with zero uh, downtime uh, during 2014 holiday. Um, I think that's a tremendous uh, feat. We uh, invested very heavily into Swift for the 2014 holiday. Uh, our current capacity is around a petabyte of uh, Swift storage. And 70% uh, of our traffic came through mobile this year, uh, which is the 2014 uh, holiday season. So mobile applications were uh, doing fantastic. Uh, and this is the third iteration. So. Uh, for uh, the Kilo release, we also plan to introduce um, SDN when we do bring it into our production. Uh, next slide, please. So where we are, six DCs currently, uh, 14 regions. Uh, this is, these are actually old numbers. I think we're way over them right now uh, with 100,000 plus production cores. I think we are 25 or 26 tenants currently, and uh, the hypervisors have also increased uh, considerably to the magnitude of 1,000. That's it. That's all I have. That's it. I don't know what happened to that slide. <laughs> We not have any content, but we are open to. Uh, so I think I think one thing which which I think James we we were going to tell us why we went into OpenStack and not the other things, and that was the you know the promise of OpenStack. I think that's the slide which we missed. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but um, one of the things that was mentioned in the keynote, and it's true to us as well, Walmart. We have a lot of vendors as well. We buy a lot of things from a lot of different hardware providers. We have different needs in different parts of the organization. So the underlying pieces to what makes up different pieces of our cloud is going to be heterogeneous. Uh, there's no way that, that Walmart will be able to run one single unified piece of hardware that makes up the cloud. Uh, that being said, there is a set of APIs that just happen to be open source that thousands of developers have written that we have access to and that we're running in production, and that's called OpenStack. So that wasn't necessarily part of the initial vision because nobody really kind of saw that in 2012. Uh, it was a, a good bet based on looking at the size of the community even then that there was a momentum that OpenStack had uh, that not everybody else had available. And it's a bet that has proven itself out. So whether we're running uh, cloud in the stores or in the clubs or in GEC, we have a, that's global e-commerce, that is a unified API. And OpenStack gives that to us, uh, unlike anything else that's available. Um, another thing I think, um, James, we wanted to talk about our biggest challenges, and I'm going to give you a hint. It's in the networking area, and it's one of your pet projects. Sure. So 
Um, so Walmart runs kind of traditional data centers, right, as you might imagine. And we have kind of traditional enterprise networking, as you might imagine. And maybe somebody can guess uh, how things are separated on the network. V VLANs, right, exactly. So, so what do we do? Uh, you know, in 2012, we were still looking at Nova Networks. Uh, there wasn't a lot of sophisticated features there. So we sort of did what Walmart had done in the rest of the networking is we did a flat network, right, for the cloud as well. And I don't think that this is an uncommon story. The problem is, is that now you've got, you know, tens of thousands of VMs on various flat networks and the security people start to freak out, right? Um, there's no real way to coordinate a tenant network from one cloud to another cloud, um, separating traffic from different zones. By the way, we cheated a little bit on that because uh, we just didn't put PCI in the cloud, right? So we avoided that whole gigantic elephant in the room on that. In order to allow our auditors and security people to have some peace of mind, the networking model is going to have to evolve. It's going to have to be a lot more sophisticated. Um, you know, and I think we've got our security guys to the point where they admit that you can't really just put a physical firewall or a PAN device of some sort between any two things in the cloud. I think they agree that that's not a workable thing. So where do you go from there? Neutron has made giant strides from even the quantum days to the neutron days. And one of the next big challenges is how do we deploy SDN uh, in an existing cloud? You have to have our, our PaaS layer that Kalyan mentioned. The PaaS layer has to understand how do you compose interesting network architectures uh, for some application that you want to do. If you have a database tier, a virtualized database tier, you probably only want it to talk to its own application tier. Um, you need to talk to a load balancer. So those things are the next challenges that we have. Uh, so the PaaS layer has to understand it. Um, interestingly enough, your developers have to understand it as well because the application has to take into account the fact that you know, it's going to have to understand differences in the way the networking works than the flat network that everyone's gotten used to. You can't just SSH into every single VM, so your access methods are different. Uh, if you want to secure things with PCI, maybe you can't SSH into any of them at all anymore, and how do you get into them to diagnose logs or problems or restart things? So that's, that's the next big challenge is what yeah, are we going to do with SDN? So, so this is a challenge from a very strategic point of view, and I think uh, we've solved some of the, the big challenges on the compute side and maybe working on the storage side, but this is, this is an area where our biggest pain point is, and this is an area where I think uh, some of us <laughs> are very, very <laughs> scared of. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much you, but uh, so this is an area we'll be looking into in the future. Um, we're already working on a bunch of POCs and some things of our own. Uh, I think another challenge I think I'm going to ask Jeff uh, here about is the recent challenge which we had last week and how we performed on it and, uh, you know, it's the, it's the poisonous thing I'm talking about. Yeah. So you're talking about <laughs> Venom. Yeah, so as you know, Venom came out. <clears throat> last week and it was a zero day. So um, we were quick to work um, with the community as well with um, a vendor to get a fix and our team um, quickly worked and, and actually deployed it um, within hours and removed that, that issue that was out there. So um, great job to our team to do that as well as um, the community for releasing something so quickly. And, and, and the promise is, I mean, the, the, again, here's the promise of OpenStack. We were able to do that within I think within the office hours, uh, our entire cloud um, rebooted all the VMs. We we have I, I think I think a lot of a uh, lot of the uh, you know credit goes to the application developers also, who've kind of built not all but most of them who've built the applications which are kind of you know cloudy in nature. So we were able to you know move traffic from one DC to another DC and you know take the entire DC and you know all in all all at the same time and we didn't have any. No, n noticeable outage. <laughs> uh, we had hiccups here and there, but you know that's the benefit of having high availability. That you might have some applications not working once in a while, but rest of the other applications can take care of the traffic and whatnot. 
Um, I think those those were the things which we wanted to cover, unless you think we missed some other things. And um, we no, we've got maybe four or five minutes, and so maybe a couple of questions. Two questions uh, from the mic here, if you would, please. Or we can end early. Or, or ask the question, then we'll repeat the question. So the question is, what kind of hardware are we using? Jane, uh, you want to? So we standardized on um, what is called a single SKU. So it's a standard blocks, and we uh, have now divided that into uh, ones that are applicable for application, for database, and for storage. Um, I don't know if we'll go down and tread down the same path in terms of when we just revisit network and SDN and everything else. The intent is not to be vendor lockdown, right? And it is, if you really think about it, it's actually infeasible when you look at the markets that are globally there and where you get it. And if you have a quick uh, SLA and a seven-day um, uptime and different regions having different market dates and everything else. So we do not want to actually standardize on a specific vendor or a specific set of hardware. We want to keep it as heterogeneous as possible. And what we want to define is a blocks like a, a standard SKU for the application, the standard SKU for the databases, and the standard SKU for the storage. I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat that. I can't hear. In, in any ways, are we working with open compute project? I think I can answer that. I think we, we are looking at uh, different open compute options, but I think uh, uh, we are in between completely open compute standard and enterprise, and I think for our use cases, I think that's probably the next iteration. So we started with, uh, I think, in the beginning of it, five SKUs, uh, and we've now narrowed it down to three SKUs, which is basically one SKU with a certain up down, just the storage which changes. Everything else is the same. And next, I think we still have very red a lot of redundant components in our uh, systems, and uh, so the next system design is probably going to get rid of some of those components, and then I think the last last step would be to go into the open computer. And 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 the the, the uh, and honestly, open computer requires a scale, which is still we we are we are almost there, but we are not completely there. Uh, so I think uh, very soon when we, as more and more properties and more and more applications from the Walmart stores and everything comes in, we'll be going into the open computer. which distribution and which configuration management tool we use. Yeah, so we're using a Rackspace Public Cloud, um, and the deployment is all based on the community Ansible playbooks. Uh, we're still sort of playing with some of the configuration pieces. So previously we have used Chef, um, and we use, P uh, we use a Puppet in our PCI environment for auditing and that sort of thing. I think. For the pieces that don't work well in Puppet, I think the next thing, or sorry, in um, Ansible, I think we'll be investigating SolStack for that stuff, and that'll sort of keep us you know, on a single language platform. At least, at least for now, there's a session later talking about whether OpenStack should allow non-Python. For now, I think it's an opportunity to sort of unify the language across with the things that we're doing. One last quick question. <laughs> <laughs> we have like 45 seconds. Okay, go ahead. You mentioned tools in your talk. Uh, that you're to develop with Python. Uh, besides Ansible, what other tools are, have you developed to enhance your OpenStack? What other tools have we developed or enhanced our OpenStack? I think we can. So I think we've, we've kind of, you know, one, we acquired a company uh, for the past layer, which manages a lot of our, um, uh, you know, on demand uh, provisioning and deployment for an application developer. On our engineering side, we have 50 seconds. OK, I was wrong. Yeah. Uh, OneOps.com is our PaaS layer. Um, so you can take a look at it there. Um, the other piece, we've developed some stuff that make running the cloud a little bit more doable. O operating the Oper cloud from an operator's point of view. So, right. so, we ha so there, are, there are different ways of looking at the same problem. Developers, developers look at the problem in one way. 
uh, from their application. They want fast deployment. Want from an operator, I would like to, uh, we we want to you know be able to reboot, restart, move capacity here and there. So we build some tools that side, and then we have all obviously you know monitoring tools and a lot of other tools. Thank and you very much for coming. Um,